Let's stand now for the reading of God's Word. We are in the Sermon on the Mount. If you're new to our church, we've been in this for many, many months, and we're coming to the end of chapter 6, where Jesus is talking about anxiety. We've been in these passages the last couple of weeks. This morning, I'm going to be reading from and preaching from Matthew 6, beginning at 25 through the end of chapter 6, verse 34. This is the word that Christ himself spoke. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. We all know what it means to be anxious, and Jesus' words here are of profound encouragement, but they're also profoundly skillful in the ways in which we as his body can actually come along one another when we're experiencing anxiety from verses 25 to 34, Jesus gives three commands. It's actually one command given three different times. He asks five questions, and then he offers three tools to help, three points of counsel. And this morning, what I want to do is look at these three commands. I want to look at the questions Jesus asks, and then I want to end by looking at the counsel that he offers, the tools that he brings. Jesus' commands are very simple. They bookend this section. Verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. And then it ends this section in verse 34, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. And then in the middle, there, it also says, therefore, do not be anxious. Verse 25, verse 31, and verse 34. Some commentators see this as a passage that is just about comfort. It's about Jesus saying, you don't have to worry. Others see it as a strong exhortation don't be anxious. But the right way of seeing it is clearly that it's a command. But it's a command that brings comfort. It's a comforting command. But it's only comforting if we understand what Jesus means by the therefore. For he doesn't just tell us not to be anxious, but tells us why we don't have to be anxious. And so Jesus does give us a command, just as Paul does in his epistle, do not be anxious about anything. Well, what is anything? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. What is everything? By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is powerful stuff. Everybody that walked in here this morning that is mildly aware of the world we live in, experiences anxiety. You know how I know? 
Because at least a dozen times this morning already, someone has said, I'm so glad you're preaching on this because I struggle with anxiety. We all do. And the Lord in his compassion knows how to help us. But he also knows the danger of that which can easily be seen as nothing more than the common cold. Anxiety really is dangerous and it's hard to overcome. If we misunderstand Jesus and we see this only as an exhortation, don't be anxious, we feel like anxiety should be easy to overcome. Now some of you remember growing up with the show Bob Newhart. He was a psychiatrist. A younger generation would know him as Papa Elf in the Christmas movie Elf, it's the same actor. If you wanna laugh at some point this week, Google just a six minute comedy piece featuring Bob Newhart as Dr. Switzer talking to a client named Catherine Bigman. She comes for help and this is how the conversation goes. He says, let me speak to you, I'm paraphrasing, about my policies, my fees. He says, I charge $5 for the first five minutes and nothing after that. She's like, wow, that seems too good to be true. And he says, well, I can almost guarantee our session won't last the full five minutes. <laughs> he says, you can pay by cash or check. And then there's this great line. He's a psychiatrist, there's this great line. I don't make change. <laughs> she, thank you, some of you are just now getting it. <laughs> she reveals to him what her issue is when he looks at his watch and says, go. She reveals that she's afraid of being buried alive in a box. He then offers his counsel by saying, I'm going to give you two words, two simple words that I want you to incorporate into your life. He pauses, leans over his desk, and almost shouts, stop it! Stop it! You know, as a pastor, sometimes that's the sermon I wanna preach. <laughs> and you think it's the sermon you wanna hear, because it would be short. <laughs> I didn't even mean that to be funny. It's just not that easy, it's not. And it's not funny, is it? Anxiety is powerful and it seeks to destroy our lives by setting our focus on things. And as we do, those things grow and the Lord shrinks. Jesus' command to not be anxious is gentle and strong. It's very clear, but it's also compelling. We begin to see his skill as our savior, as one who's proclaiming the word by the way he deals with anxiety. Jesus asked five questions, and I think this is significant. Here's why. Anxiety speaks to us constantly in questions. If you look with me at verse 30, 31, the second time Jesus gives the command not to be anxious, he says, therefore do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? The principle that he teaches here applies to all areas of anxiety. But for us, this isn't our issue. There might be some here today who don't have clothing, who don't have food. But most of us walk into a full closet and we still might say, I have nothing to wear. Or we have a teenage boy who opens the fridge and it's stocked full of good things to eat. And he slams the door saying, we have nothing to eat. This isn't our issue. But anxiety is. And anxiety speaks to us 
in questions. You receive an email from your boss that says, I would like to meet with you at some point next week. That's all it says. You receive that on a Friday and you spend the weekend wondering, what did I do wrong? What does she want to talk to me about? Have I failed? Am I gonna lose my job? If I lose my job, then where am I gonna live? Am I gonna have to go back and live with my parents? You tell your parents about this meeting, they begin to have their own anxiety speaking to them. <laughs> parents, we feel a lot of anxiety. A child isn't performing well in school or isn't making friends or is dealing with some mental, emotional issue that's very heavy. You don't know how to handle it. The questions start. Once again, your limits are revealed. I don't have enough knowledge. I can't hover over them at school. I'm not sure what to do. You go on a date, and it seems to be going well. You seem to like one another, but as that progresses, anxious questions come. Is he the one? Is she the one? Does he like me? Does she like me? You look at our culture, and this is where the church has a chance to really shine, not just by standing for the truth, which we must, but how we encounter a world that doesn't stand for the truth, even in the midst of common grace. What would it look like for us to be a non-anxious presence in a world so dark? But often we're very anxious because the questions start coming. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if they're elected and they're not elected? And all of a sudden our eyes are more focused on those things which we must give attention to, but we take them off of the Lord. And certainly we know the experience of experiencing something ourselves or with a loved one as it relates to health. And then with the help of the internet, you begin to Google what it is you've been told you might have. And oh, the questions come, don't they? One of our early elders and our first missionary that we ever sent out often says to me, when we have the privilege of meeting one-on-one, -on -one, when we grow anxious, we close our eyes, we close our ears, and our mind goes crazy. It does. Jesus asks the question. Five times he speaks into the things that are making them anxious because he knows the destruction of what anxiety can lead to. Let's think about King David for a minute. Second Samuel 11, King David does something he shouldn't do. While all kings are at war, which is where he should be, he looks out and he sees Bathsheba. She's bathing, she's naked. He desires her. She's brought to him, there is sin. Word then comes to him that she is pregnant. This is an unplanned pregnancy, it's a crisis pregnancy. What does this man who's called a man after God's own heart do? Does he listen immediately to the word and confess his sin and move into what he should do as a man of God? No. As his mind swirls with questions, because anxiety speaks to us in questions, he seeks to fix it so that no one would know it's his child that she's pregnant with. So he calls for her husband to come home, Uriah the Hittite. Uriah in his purity won't even go be with his wife. So David continues to move through this anxious time, making decisions that are horrific. And he has this soldier move to the front and then tells those troops to be told to retreat so that that man might be killed. Anxiety can be extremely destructive. Think about the apostle Peter. In Mark 14, you know, Jesus tells Peter before that that he's going to deny him before the rooster crows twice. Peter basically rejects what Jesus says. I will never do that, even if I have to die. But then when the young servant girl accuses him of being one of his own, the anxiety sets in. If I say I belong to him, what will happen to me? 
He didn't just do this once, but three times just as Christ said. Mark tells us that he called down curses upon himself. And what that means is, I would rather be found dead than for you to believe that I was associated with him. Do you think Peter ever thought it was possible for him to say something like that? But he did. When Mary Jo and other Thrive Advocates meet with clients, they come. And when they come into that room, anxiety has been speaking to them. I know firsthand what that looks like. A child of this community, Clay Coffey, Roy and Janice Coffey's son, was a volunteer with me in the church I served in St. Louis and was passionate about standing up for children in the womb. He taught me so much. One day we discovered that a girl who was connected to our youth group, wasn't actually involved in our youth group, was connected to our youth group, was pregnant. Not for the first time, but for the second. The first child was aborted. I've told this story before, but it's been many years, and many of you weren't even in this church yet. Clay and his wife, Hillary, called me and said, would you go with us across the Mississippi River into East St. Louis, because you couldn't get an abortion in St. Louis County, to meet her before she goes into the clinic? And I said, sure, I'll go. I'd never done anything like this, didn't know what to do. We got there after about a 45 minute drive. We drove across the river, parked and waited and waited and waited a long time. And finally her boyfriend and her pulled in, her name is Aaron. We didn't have a plan, but as soon as her boyfriend got out of the car, Clay went to talk to him. Hillary prayed and I went and put myself on my knees right at her seat so she couldn't get out. And as I sat there talking to her, I prayed, Hillary prayed, Clay prayed. And I said, you don't have to do this today. It was the spring of 2000. My wife was at home almost an hour away, pregnant with our third child, Caden. All I wanted was her to meet my wife so that she could see the pictures of a sonogram that showed he's alive. Watch a video of his heart beating. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed, listening to her anxiety. And she said what you would expect, including this. If my parents knew, they would kill me. Think about that. I said to her, they won't kill you. She grew up in a Catholic family, very opposed to what she had already done once, certainly opposed to what she was about to do. I said, they won't kill you. But you know, you're a parent. By God's grace, she said, I'll go meet your wife. We called the local St. Louis clinic, much like the one Mary Jo serves, and a woman named Robin Dubel came over and met with her at our home. What led her to that place was anxiety. Not what we might call common anxiety, but a profound sense of, I can't do this. My parents will reject me. I will be alone. Anxiety speaks in questions. What will you do? You're only a junior in high school. What will you do with your friends? What will you do with your future? Those questions get loud. And as those questions get loud, the crisis gets bigger and bigger and bigger in our minds. And what we need as believers is to have a non-anxious presence where we move towards people, helping them, even those who are in Christ, see that God is bigger. God is greater. Christ is far larger than the crisis that you're in. And so Jesus asked these five questions. And these five questions are meant to elevate their vision of how good God is, how great God is, how big God is. These questions come in verse 25, 26, 27, 28, and 30. 
And as he asks these questions, he reveals profound counsel. Look with me at the first question, verse 25. I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. First question, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? He knows food matters. He knows clothing matters. But he's getting at the essence of what matters most. He then gives his first instruction of counsel. There are three things that Jesus does in his counsel. The first is this. It's an action. He says, look. When you and I are anxious, we are already looking at whatever it is that's making us anxious and listening to the questions that are speaking to us. The way in which we break out of that is to look. Jesus is so brilliant here. He says, verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Then comes the second question. Are you not of more value than they? You are. You are. We and him are far greater Jesus then leads to his second point of counsel. He says in verse 28, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. The word consider there literally means study. Do you know what meditation is? It's study. And so often we're meditating and studying on the questions that are coming to us. What if, what if, what if? Jesus says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Jesus is showing us that the Lord provides. Thirdly, he tells us in verse 33, along with looking, along with studying, considering, he says in verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. For us, our primary concern is not food. It's not clothing, what we're gonna wear. There are many things that make us anxious and anxiety speaks to us with so many questions. But the principles of Christ's counsel is right every time. Look, look around you. There is a God that is in control. Consider what you see and see the goodness of God, the provision of God. Seek his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. What Jesus is pointing to in his sermon and what the word of God points to from beginning to end is the history of redemption. That this father who knows everything about us, who knows what we need, he is our provision, he is our protection, he is our priority because we are his. God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The greatest fear we should have is the fear of God. The fear of God not being who he says he is. But we need not fear that. Christ Jesus was given to us as provision. Provision that we would have him for all eternity. Speaking of clothing, Christ Jesus was given to us that he and his righteousness might clothe our unrighteousness. All who are in Christ are clothed. He reveals to us in his word that we're his. That he will never leave us or forsake us. We're his priority. How amazing is that? Anxiety cannot be dealt with just by you hearing or saying to yourself or saying to another, stop it. Anxiety is not like a pot of water on a gas stove where when you turn out the flame, it cools down quickly. It's like an electric stove 
where once those words of anxiety speak to you, the stove is lit and it stays hot. And even if you turn it on, it remains hot for a long time to the touch. Anxiety is real and it can be so destructive and our Savior knows. And with compassion in his heart and compassion in his command, he says, therefore, don't be anxious. The reasons are because who his Father is, who the Holy Spirit is, and who we are in him. Father in heaven, we know the familiarity of this pain. And sometimes we wish it was that simple. But what we also know is that you have promised to lead us, that you're with us, that you will never forsake us. So Lord, as we, your people, sit here filled with anxious questions, anxiety speaking to us. Starting now, Father, this day, would you give us the power and ability to look and see your goodness, your grace, your glory? Would you cause the things that are overwhelming us to grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace? Father, would you cause us not to just look, but also to consider, to meditate upon how you have saved us and how you continually rescue us. Father, would you show us your presence when we seek you, your kingdom and your righteousness, that priority, and in doing so, we see that we are yours. Father, there are many in our body who are feeling un unthinkable weight. Lord, bring them close and bring us close to them that we might walk with them and their hurts. Friends, whatever you're anxious about, don't be anxious about it alone. Come and talk to one of the pastors, somebody that you know who loves Christ. And Lord, as we finish with this beautiful piece of music. Let the words not just be beautiful, but let them soak into our hearts with this profound truth of who you were, who you will be, who you are, the same yesterday, today, and forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.